Hello, everybody. My name is Pollyanna, and I look after Tree Sisters in Australia, and I'm also doing various bits for Tree Sisters in the UK at the moment. And I'm really excited that you can join us today as we talk with two people who are very closely associated with the new planting project that we are funding in West Borneo, otherwise known as Kalimantan. And they are Noor Febriani, who is the executive director of Alam Sahat Lestari, otherwise known as ASRI, and Mahadika Putra, who is the conservation director for ASRI. So welcome, both of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Thank sure, you for thank you so much, Pollyanna, and have, uh, for everyone also joining us today. So I have a bunch of questions for you. I'll just give the people watching some context. So we recently started funding a project through Health in Harmony, and that project is in West Borneo, as I said, at Ganung Kalung National Park, and it's reforesting peat swamp forest. And um, ASRI is responsible for all of the activities in that area, is that right? Yeah, that's true, because we're working uh, since 2007 uh, nearby the Gunung Palung National Park, an area of 108,000 hectares. Um, um, we are actually working not only in uh, nearby the Gunung Palung National Park, but recently also working nearby Bukit Baka, Bukit Raya National Park, but the uh, funds uh, supported by Three Sister is the uh, for our work near uh, Gunung Palung National Park. Wonderful, thank you. So the the first question I'd really love to ask you is, uh, what does the forest mean to you, personally and maybe collectively, and in what ways is it important to you? Okay, let me start. As many of uh, people said that uh, forest is home. Um, from my side, I see that's exactly true. If we see forest, it's really priceless, not only the thing above it, but also the underground above until the top of the trees is all very priceless, very important. First, uh, I would say like uh, we don't want to lose um, this priceless thing. They are so important, very valuable. And we, if the forest gone, we will lose many things, many important things. First, we could say, of course, the biodiversity, the beautiful creatures like orangutan or uh, hornbills that they can only live in the forest. Mm. Uh, we can also lose the delicious fruits, maybe. Yeah, like uh, durian, mangosteen, a lot of very uh, delicious fruits, uh, wild fruits also. We don't want to lose the fresh, clean air. Um, also the fresh and clean water, the giant trees that can absorb um, carbon and also we don't want to lose the pharmacy as we know that mm. many of the natural medicines come from the forest. So I, if I'm looking at the forest, it's really something that we need to keep to, we don't want to lose it because it's too valuable. That's from yeah. me. Thank you. Please. Yeah, I think I'll just um, echoing what Fabric has mentioned. Um, but first, let me just say that um, if we lose our rainforest, it's game over for all of us. You know, our rainforest is so precious that our life depending on it. So mm. from the from the food on the table that we have, water, oxygen, medicine, climate regulation, and so much more, and. It really, if you look at the benefit of the rainforest itself, it's, it's numerous, right? And then second, we also need to understand that um, we cannot be healthy and thrive without healthy and natural ecosystems. And 
often we often forget that we're living on the same planets you know oh if the forest if the rainforest in indonesia um destroyed or oh, it's indonesian's problem no it's not because we're living in the same in the same planet so if we lose our forest here in indonesia it will affect um the whole um you know air circulations oxygen circulations and you know it's just um we just um, often, least, um, you know, uh, look at things in a diff in 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 a silos. You know, we put them in a, in a separate things, and we forget that they are connected to each other. That we connect to our forests, we connect to the, the ecosystem that we're living in. So um, I think, yeah, that's um, uh, what I think about uh, the meaning of the forest, um, and also. Um, um, you know, uh, many communities around the world living around the forest that really, really depending on the forest as much as um, they did. I mean, compared to us who may be living in the city, um, if the forest is gone, I mean, their livelihood is gone as well. Um, the food, uh, the food of the source of the community is gone, you know, and if their, you know, life affected, our life is also affected. So, yeah. yeah. I think, um, yeah, and it's provide a lot of jobs all around the world as well. So not just um, uh, tangible, um, uh, useful of the forest, but also a lot of, um, you know, um, benefit of the forest that uh, we have not yet seen, but we forgot uh, that it's there. Yeah, thank you. Um, those communities that live in and around the forest, do they have... Um like a deeper relationship with the forest um, over and above the food and medicine? Like, is there a spiritual aspect to their relationship with the forest? Um, <clears throat> as, for, as far as I know, for uh, spiritual, um, Malai is not really much into it, but for a Dayak people, I guess it's more uh, attached uh, to the forest. Um, like they're also having this uh, in the uh, Kashmiri law, like do not uh, cut the forest, for example. So that's uh, they're more attached than um, Malay, but. But mostly for Malay people, we're more into uh, food um, and also medicines. Um, yeah. yeah, I think in addition, yes, in addition to that, I think in the context of uh, Gunung Palung National Park, where we're working at the moment, um, most of the, some of the people here are um, migrating from Java. So they don't really have um, like historic, um, historic ties uh, with, with, with the forest. So that's yeah. why they see the forest as a, as um, how can I say, like as a, as a saving, you know, where you can always, if you need something, you go to the forest, you know, you need money, you go to the forest, you need food, you go to the forest, you know, but with uh, indigenous community uh, in our replication site in Bukit Baka, Bukit Raya National Park, um, they are, indigenous community so they they have really strong ties with the forest um you know they honor they honor the forest and they really have um um yeah uh sort of strong connections uh with the forest yeah okay thank you so i'm very curious how i'd love to hear from both of you how you got involved with asri and um and also how you're involved with the project at Ganung Palang National Park. Okay, so for me, it, of course, it started when I saw the vacancy mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in 2018. So my background is public health and also development. So I work uh, with um, NGOs before and mostly in health field. Um, and but lastly, I learned more about environment when I work with the IFRC uh, in the area of disaster risk reduction and also and community resilience. 
So this combination of experience of the health, public health and um, uh, environment, I think is a perfect combination also for ASRI. So I replaced the former executive director. I come back to my hometown because I actually come from West Borneo. And so here I am trying to restore the home. Um, and the project with Gunung Pal, uh, nearby the, in Gunung Palung, yeah, the restoration that we do is uh, in, the in the Gunung Palung National Park also. I, as the executive director, of course, I responsible, uh, not directly, but uh, Dika is more direct in this uh, project. Uh, but of course, this is uh, very important as the restoration, reforestation is the a core of the, uh, what Astro is doing. Hmm. Dika, please. Um, yeah, as for me, I also saw the vacancy. I actually applied for a Febris role <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> but <laughs> so we're kind of like rivalry in the beginning. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm so happy that Febri got it. And I was offered as a conservation program manager in the beginning. So uh, when I joined, I offered as a conservation program manager. And then one year um, that I joined the program, uh, or two years, I got promoted to uh, program director. So, but my uh, knowledge with Gunung Palung National Park um, has started in 2010 when I did my master. So I did uh, study uh, endangered uh, tropical trees. Um, I studied their genetics in Gunung Palung. So I took samples and then I went back to Gunung Palung again for my PhD uh, work in um, different species, but still endangered uh, tropical tree species. Um, and then, yeah, and then I, I joined ASRI in uh, 2018 at the same time um, as uh, February did. And then I just mesmerized with the, with, the, with the project and I learned a lot actually. So I gained more than what I actually, um, you know, deliver for the project itself because I don't really have any background in, in medical health whatsoever. So um, it's, it's, it's so nice for me to to know, you know, um, or to learn uh, different different uh, type of multidisciplinary, um, you know, outside of my my area of expertise. Yeah, great. So so um, February, one of the things you said made me think about the uniqueness of of what Health in Harmony and Asri are doing, which is the combination of the health the healthcare and the environmental aspect. And I'd really love to hear from both of you um, how that came about and um, anything else that you'd like to share about that combination, because that's quite unique for Tree Sisters has got uh, 11 different projects. And this is the first one that we've got, which combines health and environment in this way. So I'd really love to hear from you both about that. Yeah, exactly. This is also very, very interesting personally for me too, like working in the same building where you you can see the health professional working at the same building with the conservationist, with the educate educators, uh, environment uh, educators. So it's very nice to see. Very uh, and and also we knew that uh, Asri. Uh, we have clinic, uh, medical center, and it's the the only one medical center uh, who uh, that applying the non cash payment, especially uh, the seedlings in Indonesia, and maybe in in the world too. We don't know, but but so as we started, when people, seed people can bring they can pay for their healthcare with seedlings, is that right? Yes, so the patients can pay with seedlings, but not only seedlings actually, they can also pay with handicrafts, they can also pay with uh, manure um, um, labor too. But the, the most popular uh, non-cash payment is the seedlings. Last year only yeah. we received more than 23,000 uh, uh, trees 
from the patients. So for the healthcare and some also for deposits, for savings. Um, so it's the only one in Indonesia, uh, maybe also in the world that has this system very structured and started in 2007 until now it's more than 65,000 seedlings have been wow. uh, given by the patients yeah so we are so proud uh, of this um, um, approach and they're all uh, native uh, Borneo uh, species the trees where we value more for the trees that is more rarely uh, so the rare species will be valued more than the uh, common species um, and because we know the the strong relation between human health and uh, forest health so the more we know about it the more we we value both the community also we need to work on their health otherwise if they are sick they can't get enough uh, livelihood um, so they can go to forest and lock the forest uh, the, the trees so if they are both healthy and we support with the economic opportunities as well uh, the education so this will be a, a comprehensive approach to save both the people and the forest mm, thank you and i think i'd like to add um, something into that as well i think what makes our program unique is that we implemented radical listening uh, i don't know if you have heard about it it's 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 the method that we use uh in our program where we go to the communities and then sit together with them and then spend hours and hours listening to them and our program is actually built up based on the solutions that came from community who wanted to protect the forest but they couldn't um, so they were often logging to pay for health care, for food on the table, you know, to uh, support their family. Um, so they said, um, after, uh, in the beginning of the radical listening, I believe that they said that if they had an access to high quality, affordable health care and training in organic farming, they could stop logging. And they did. I mean, we've seen it from from wow. uh, from from the baseline results that we that we did. Um, and I think another interesting uh, things about the pro our project is that the fact that we don't just want to see the forest thriving, but we also want to see people thriving. And um, you know, both can can thriving. We don't really have to choose, and that's what the uniqueness about the about the about the program. Yeah, yeah, I love that that recognition that you know human health and forest health is intertwined, and also you know we human beings we are part of nature, so it, it seems crazy to separate everything out when it's actually all interconnected. So um, I'd love to hear what it is that both of you most enjoy or like or feel proud of about the project that would be really great for me uh from asri from this project the reforestation reforestation project uh done by asri i learned something that i didn't knew before uh, i didn't know before like we can't do tree planting only to reach numbers of trees say 1 million trees, we plant 1 million trees. Is that really important? No, for us three, that's not really important. The, how we do it is we, we need, we really need to keep on eye on the number of species. We plant various of trees, the three species, so that the many uh, animals can live in. If we only plant one, one tree species, then only very few animals who will come mm. but with more animals who will come and live in this new habitat there will be more trees coming because they will come 
uh, from other place and bring uh, seeds uh, and put it there. And so more yeah. tree species will come. Will be it will be then back into the the nature how the forest is really uh, the origin of the nature the the forest. So that is what I value the most that we don't do tree planting only for like making it green. We don't only plant uh, trees that is uh, fast growing. We don't do that. We value slow growing also very important most important we we want to protect the biodiversity yeah yeah it's very yeah. philosophical <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and i think um as for me um i i work a lot in the background of um academic and research so i've never really been working directly with community and it provides me a lot of uh, challenge and then i need to low my you know low my um my standard you know low my uh like try to 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 swift you know, switch my angle and then perspective, you know, and then try to see things from different perspective and then try to put myself in their shoes as well. And it's, 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 it's so difficult, you know, working with community, especially with community that has been um, getting a promises, you know, getting uh, support, but our program have been implemented, but they've been using as an object for, for a while. So there's a lot of uh effort that need to be done to build trust with community and we believe at Astri that community is the center of our work and you know um that we need to work closely with them we need to you know uh to uh to maintain their trust and at the same time we need to work collaboratively with park officer local government other ngos or even grantors or donor that um, can make our programs um you know happen so yeah um but the beauty thing about working at asri is that asri does not really focusing on problems you know but as we are focusing on possibilities because it, it, it provides us with more opportunities and yeah that's um i think that's the thing that i really love uh, working uh, with us yeah it's so inspired it's such an inspiring the whole um project and what asri does and the combination of health and environment it's so it's so inspiring um so another question I have for you is what, what would you like others to know um, about the area where the project is and about the project itself? Like maybe you'd like to speak to um, how the project got off the ground, um, what happened since it began, any uh, challenges or big kind of wins that you've had in whatever part of the project it would be lovely to hear just some more details from you both about things that uh, our audience might be interested to hear about the project. Um, I think that we are trying always to improve our reforestation project is one thing that I want to share to you. Um, so this year, we try really to, uh, we want to be more eco-friendly in doing the reforestation project. Um, we want to, to reduce our, uh, we want to reduce using plastic. Uh, usually we use thousands of poly bags uh, mm. for our uh, uh, reforestation program in our nursery um, especially so we know it but it's really challenging you know um, we need that we need that to 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 do uh, to grow the seedlings so this year we talk with the Gunung Palung National Park officials officers uh, and we already uh, work with a group of women near 
the Gunung Palung National Park, we make uh, biodegradable poly bags. So this new eco poly bags from bamboo made by uh -huh. women uh, is now being our uh, idea and innovations. We would like to use that more uh, because it will reduce the use of the plastic poly bags. So we will use that and actually also that can help uh, the economic of the women also. So this, this is, I think, really a new way that we're uh, doing now, uh, which is uh, like a win-win solution because yeah. uh, this is the problem. And now we get this can help the community also to help us uh, reducing plastic. Yeah, that's brilliant. It's really wonderful. Yeah, and another thing that I'd like to add into that is that we um, we have um, we have a program uh, that we call Chainsaw Buyback Program. Uh, we bought a chainsaw from the former logger, and then really this former logger who usually who used to destroy the you know the, the forest by um, logging uh, and chopping the tree down we engage them into sustainable program where, we, where they could um, provide new businesses without have to destroy the forest. And then recently, we also asked them to plant uh, and growing uh, seedlings um, so that they also contributes, um, they also contributes to, the, to our reforestation's work. Um, so each of them, um, you know, grow uh, about, about 500 seedlings. So not just uh, making a living out of growing seedlings, but they can also, um, you know, uh, involve in, in, in restorations um, firsthand. And yeah, we're, we're very proud that they can transition from, um, you know, a destroyer to conservationist, we hope, yeah. in, the, in the future as well. Yeah. I saw, I saw on the ASRI website the some photographs of the chainsaw buyback, you know, these big rooms yeah. full of all the chainsaws. It made me wonder where, where do they go, the chainsaws? What happens to them all? Every would you like to answer this? <laughs> <laughs> no, Dika, please, Dika, please. Oh, uh, yeah. So we, um, this is also the idea of our founder that we would like to build an art, um, um, like art uh, monument out of the chainsaw. Just to oh, wow. remind people how how destroy. I mean, this is this is actually a really good equipment in the beginning. You know, it 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 makes um you know our our work in cutting the tree uh, or processing the tree more easily. But lately, it's, it's it has been using to destroy our forests, right? So mm. we would like to set up a reminder where people will remind. Oh, this is um this is the chainsaw. We will use it for education. So we try to build an art uh, for monument that made up of the chainsaw. But at the moment, we also studied uh you know pieces of uh, pieces of the chainsaw um, that can be um, you know uh, made into like art. Or handicraft that can be sell as a souvenir. Um, so, like a chain. We were thinking of uh, how to, you know, how to make an art out of the chain. And then we make a really good um, machete um, out of the bar of the chainsaw. And we didn't know that before. So oh, there's a lot of there's a lot of possibilities um, that we still try to figure out on what to do out of the chainsaw that we, uh, you know, bought from the from the former loggers. Yeah. I love that. I love the idea of making a monument and just having it be there as something yeah. that reminds everybody. <laughs> That's so great. Um, and I, I'm really curious about the, the loggers and, you know, now we're talking about the chainsaws and how it, how, how the process happened of approaching people who were cutting trees and inviting them into doing something different and whether that was that an easy process were they happy to do that or you know has it been a long process to get people to shift what they're doing yeah um so before i i answer your questions i think um a bit a bit of the background of the chainsaw buyback yes, so yeah. um we started 
Chenso Biobank in 2017. And by the time when we started the Chenso Biobank, it's actually uh, the purpose of the program is to um, to uh, to go for a really hardcore uh, illegal logger that cannot uh, transition into other alternative livelihoods simply because they don't have any skill or educations or land or land for agricultural you know to work with. Mm -hmm. So we uh, we kind of like thinking oh maybe we should uh, maybe we can buy the chainsaw and then uh, change change it into a new businesses. And then that's where the program started. Um, so it, it designed to, um, you know, to to approach all of those uh, former loggers that are difficult to uh, transition. Of course, when we talk about loggers, um, in this context, we're focusing on Gunung Palung National Park. Of course, there's a lot of loggers that are working outside of National Park, but since our goal and our objectives is to conserve and protect Gunung Palung National Park ecosystems, so we're focusing uh, first hands on the, the ecosystem of Gunung Palung National Parks. So, yeah, um, uh, at the so we're working closely with uh, with uh, Gunung Palung uh, National Park officer. So they they did a lot of um, a lot of uh, like forest uh, forest guardians across the across the entire park. And then whenever they found um, whenever they found loggers, um, like uh, they caught red-handed uh, using you know doing doing uh, logging in the forest, and they will come to us three. And then ask us to to uh, educate them, and then um, you know uh, uh, ask us to uh, like provide um, you know uh, not just educations but also explain how the program can help them shifting from uh, their uh, current job as a logger to uh, more uh, sustainable livelihood. And apart from that, we also uh, know. Uh, and then have some list from our forest guardians that are living in each village that we're having an MOU with um, that, oh, this, this person's still logging, this person's still logging. So we kind of like going to that person as well and then try to influence them to come and join the program. And then some of them are, are um, you know, uh, after several um, several sessions, they usually said, "Oh yeah, I, I would love to join the program and I would love to transition because they understand uh, what is the impact of um, getting away from being a logger to uh, joining a sustainable livelihood. You know, it's it's more safety for them because if they get caught by the by the park officer, they can be put in jail, and if they're put in jail, you know, their family will not." Um, there's no person that can support their family, you know. Yeah. Uh, so they understand that, and then they understand that they've been destroying because they simply think that they don't have choice. But now that they have choices in front of their, you know, in front of their faces, they might just choose the, you know, that that uh, that options, and then, you know, uh, move on with with uh, more sustainable livelihood. So yeah, that's how, how we did it. And we usually do a, like, um, like a small interview on the using of uh, chainsaw, like how many trees did they, do they cut uh, the chainsaw? Uh, how many trees did they cut with the chainsaw when they have the chainsaw? So it also kind of like give us the idea of mm. how many trees um, that we can save by, you know, by taking all of the chainsaw. Like so far it's around, 35,000 because the average of wow. using, yeah, 35,000 adult trees. When we talk about yeah. adult trees, it's the, the diameter of the trees is more than 30 or 40 centimeters because that's when uh, the tree usually chopped down by the loggers. Yeah. So yeah, given that in mind, um, uh, we know how impactful it is, uh, you know, uh, from this uh, chainsaw buyback program alone on uh, on rate of deforestation of the forest because mo nowadays most of the deforestation is caused by a small um, a small uh, scale uh, logging uh, family yeah. but Fabri would you like to add <laughs> yeah uh, perhaps the thing that makes it work the approach how to approach these hardcore loggers 
uh, because we see them as a father. We see them as a husband who want to, they only work to feed their family no more. Mm -hmm. They are yeah. not rich at all. So yes. they're really living in poverty. We can see the house, you can see the house that was in uh, is in the picture in our website say something like that there the one who will be rich is the the middleman and the seller of the uh wood the logs yeah but they're really not so there we we come to them and we remind them about the risk they are facing actually the risk of being caught the risk of getting injuries because of the the trees um, and also they actually owe money before they went into the forest because they need some money for the capital in to to cover the cost in the forest as well as to to provide uh, money for the family so they have to owe money before they went to go to the forest but now with their transition to the new jobs. Uh, for example, they are selling, uh, they, they have grocery uh, also, or uh, selling um, uh, whatever, uh, ped, what's that? Peddler? Peddling. Peddle shop. Oh, yeah, like peddling. Uh, yeah, that yeah, one. shop and then... Uh, uh, car wash i think and then yeah there's um i think there, there are about uh, 20, 25 of businesses yeah right and so with this they uh they they're happy because they earn money more regularly and don't have to think about that risk so much so yeah. uh, well they uh at until now, it's more than 150 loggers joining uh, wow. our Chenso Buyback program. Wow. And, that, and we were saying before, Dika, that that's, that's saved about 35,000 trees from being cut. Yeah, we use um, the average of, um, so yeah, roughly around 35,000. And the yeah. number was increasing um you know because when they have the when they have the the chainsaw even though they didn't use it sometimes they occasionally rent it out to other people uh, to use it yeah. so if they're not using it somebody might using it you know so yeah. picking up the chainsaw you cut the 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 usage of the chainsaw and you know you yeah we're just using the projections of how many tree average that has been cut uh, when they have the chainsaw and then using it to project how many trees we actually could save, you know, by taking up yeah. the chainsaw. It's, am yeah. it's amazing how simple it is. It's such an amazingly simple solution. And I really love that, uh, you know, in a lot of places in the world, loggers are sort of demonized as these bad people. And yeah. I, I really love this approach of, um, you know, really treating them like human beings and, 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 why are they doing this and what does it yeah. mean for them to not be able to do it it's um it's yeah it feels very unique and quite <laughs> wonderful <laughs> and they are human being you know yeah. they they just um they're just not for i mean if you are a person and logging is the only thing you know since your childhood like you don't really have any skill or educations or whatsoever. We met this one logger that says he regrets that he left school and joined his father for logging. But at the time, he doesn't have any choices. You know, mm -hmm. he needs to support, um, you know, his father because his father is too old to for doing logging. And then he's like, he feels like he's the man of the house. And then later he found out that it's the only skill that he's had, you know. He, he told us, you know, I want to be a fisherman, but I don't know how to swim. I'll be drowned <laughs> out, you know. I want to be, I want to be teaching, but I don't know how to teach. I don't have any educational background, you know. This is the only thing that I have. And would yeah. this be the end of my life? Would this be the end of my, you know, for my family? Just because this is the only thing that I know? No, you know, we provide them with, with options. I mean, and then 
um, yeah, uh, one more thing in, in our Chainsaw Bio program, we designed together. So uh, we decided together. So what, uh, what type of businesses that they would like to do, we support that. Um, and then if, it's, if the idea wasn't really good, for example, oh, he wants to open small shop, but there's plenty of small shop in the area. So it doesn't really make sense. So, you know, they need to make their, themselves stand out in order to attract more customer, for example. You know, and then we shop together. So we don't give them cash, you know, uh, in, in, in exchange of the chainsaw that they given to us. So we, we, we shop together, you know, what do they need to establish their new businesses? We provide it with, uh, with the money, um, you know, uh, and as an exchange of the, of the chainsaw. So that's how, how we do it. Yeah, that's amazing. That's really amazing. Um, I'd also love to hear a little bit about the, the organic agriculture program, because I know that that's what some of the, is, is it that some of the people who were logging have switched to organic agriculture or is, or is it that people needed to switch to organic agriculture for a different reason? Can, can yes, uh, more than 50% more than of the former logger um, has transitioned into uh, farming. So in wow. the beginning of the program in 2007, we have counted roughly around 1,350 loggers. And then just five years into the program, um, we only have 450 loggers left. So most of these loggers easily transitions into farming because they own land. Um, right. Yeah, and then, but they, they um, in, in our radical listening sessions, they were kind of like asking, yeah, but we don't really know how to manage the land using uh, non-chemical uh, fertilizer. Will you be able to teach us on how to use uh, or organic um, you know, fertilizer, organic pesticides? And that's what we did. So um, since 2009, we formed uh, around 19, Oh, sorry, a 17 uh, group, a farmers group. And then since then, 10 of them has been registered uh, in, 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 in the government, which means that they can access um, uh, local funds or government funds to support their, um, you know, their, their uh, farming. Uh, but we also keep uh, doing uh, a lot of training, uh, intensive training with the community, on how to make uh, organic fertilizer, organic pesticides, how to, you know, grow their own seedlings, um, yeah, and then improving quality of the of the products, which is also contributing to the health of the whole community and and the animals and the forest and the water and everything. So it's yeah, really amazing. So um, probably this would be maybe the second to last question. I'm just curious about whether there's been any significant impacts on the project and the communities in the project because of COVID-19. Um, from Asri, we got some new uh, project after this COVID for the community. So we have a program called um, COVID stimulus conservation fund where we help the loggers they already thought about it that some, the loggers who are now uh, trying to survive their new business after transition but you know with the challenge of covid some mm. actually economic is uh, difficult now so like the shop is not as uh, crowded as before uh, uh well it's uh the the demand is reducing so uh they need help in the economic side so we, what we are doing with this covid stimulus uh program we ask them to uh to grow seedlings which will then be used in our reforestation and we pay them with that and that's actually really helpful because they can work uh, to run their business, but also still just, you know, just uh, growing seedlings. They have that. Uh, we ask our forest guardians to train them in uh, growing the seedlings. And sometimes they not only 
the ex-loggers, the family can also help with uh, growing the seedlings. So it's kind of uh, a positive way um, and something that we can offer to the community because they really need help uh, in that. And also like uh, I see it from, you know, during the COVID many of the programs is now just uh, run digitally. So mm. it's in also a good way for us three to share what we are doing. Now we run many webinars uh, and people in Indonesia or, or outside of Indonesia can know and listen uh, to what we are doing and uh, it's a, in a good way they also we got more support like uh, morally and also some financially like people who wants to involve directly to Asri. Yeah that's an unexpected benefit <laughs> yeah. of having exactly. to to digital yeah and also exactly. think, otherwise otherwise who will know Asri? It's the only a small NGO near the jungles. <laughs> like yeah. no one comes to this area. But with with after the COVID, it's many people know Asri now. <laughs> yeah. And I think uh Fabri forgot to mention as well, you know, we know we realize that um COVID-19 has impacted, um, you know, global economy and with our community here as well, it's as well as impacted, you know, so we, uh, we also in, in, in part of the COVID-19 stimulus uh, program, we bought, um, you know, uh, agricultural products from our farmer. Uh, and then uh, we distributed the products that we purchased from the farmers to uh, to you know to unfortunate people in the community. So like um, you know widows, um, um, old people, for example, you know people were affected from from COVID nineteen or people, you know less unfortunate less fortunate people. So we 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 distribute the you know the products that uh, we purchase from our farmers. Yeah, brilliant. It really seems like Azri is um, supporting the communities and the forest in so many different ways that are all kind of interwoven. It's very holistic. It's a brilliant model. So um, I know one of the one of the things that's really appealing to a lot of our donors is the the um, possibility also in in amongst all of this of protecting and uh, wild orangutan habitat. And I wondered if if either of you might like to say something about the orangutans just before we wrap up. I think I'll start with me. Um, the orangutan is one of the key species in Gunung Palung National Park. Um, actually, both uh, Gunung Palung National Park and our site replications, it's uh, considered to be um, the, the habitat for orangutan. Well, in Gunung Palung National Park, we try to protect uh, roughly around 2,500 wild orangutan wow. and the orangutan that has been rescued or it has been rescued will be translocated into uh, BBBR site in our replication site. So both, um, both uh, sites were, were so special to our heart. And not to mention about the biodiversity and type of ecosystems in Gunung Palung National Park. Um, there are seven types of ecosystems. So at the moment, we work in two types of ecosystems in a tropical lowland area and a pit swamp area. And then one of the future projects that we will have with Three Sister is actually located in pit swamp area and, um, and, and lowland area. So um, uh, in our restorations project, uh, of course, um, you know, our organizations, it's not uh, directly focusing on the conservations of orangutan. Um, mm. there's, um, there are two organizations in the landscape that are working uh, to achieve the conservations of, of the species, of the orangutan species. But what can we do as an organization? Because we 
uh, we uh, try to protect biodiversity and orangutan is one of the part of biodiversity that we would like to protect within Gunung Palung National Park. So what we did is that we uh, built in our reforestations program, we built corridor, um, corridor uh, for wildlife corridor, but we call it orangutan corridor because um, we realize that a lot of orangutan that has been using the corridor, um, you know, to getting from one uh, a forest area to another forest area, and these two uh, forest patches has been fragmented uh, severely because of the um, you know anthropogenic uh, disturbance of us humans. So we would like to connect these two fragment, uh, fragmented forests and then um, you know, given the, the orangutan populations um, a chance to meet with one another from one fragmented forest to another fragmented forest because it's, it's, it's crucial for their, um, you know, for, for their uh, future. Uh, and that's what we did. And with the help, uh, you know, from our donor and especially like Tree Sister, we plan to restore and expanding more uh, of this uh, critical uh, corridor of orangutan. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, tree planting is the top climate change solution. We know that the, the cheapest option uh, possible and every one of us can get involved. And we don't want to only protect one by one orangutan. We want to protect them all. So what we need to do is to save their home. Uh, by saving their home, their habitat, they will be safe inside. They can be more reproduced and we can see them just by looking, I mean like, if we are lucky, we can see them, uh, but they're safe inside. So that's what we are doing. Uh, we try to save the home by educate and by help the community nearby the forest because they are the guardians. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. It's been really, really fascinating to hear about the project and um, especially all the information about the, you know tra transitioning the loggers into something more sustainable it's really wonderful to hear about that and um, uh, yeah I feel very privileged to have been able to hear it from you firsthand so thank you so much both of you for sharing yeah thank you for giving us a, yeah thank you for giving us a platform to to introduce our organizations and to to uh, speak up on what we think it matters and hopefully everyone who tune in or listen to uh, can be inspired and also you know uh, wanting to to do uh, similar things towards um, you know protecting our biodiversity whatever uh, would it be you know so yeah thank you for this opportunity as well yeah it's really really uh, important and uh, really precious opportunity for us to share this. Uh, especially we knew that you are supporting uh, our work here to the ground by supporting us three. Like you're not only planting trees, but you also uh, protect the biodiversity and the human uh, here. So we are so thank thankful for, for your support. Yeah, thank you, Febri. And I, I hope that, you know, that there are some people watching who will be really inspired by what Asri is doing and perhaps bring it to, you know, other parts of the world. That would be amazing. And for those of you watching, if you are, if you would love to support this project through Tree Sisters and, uh, and also support our other amazing tree planting projects, please do go to our website and you can find out more there about giving and um, helping to helping Azri to do more of this really incredible work in the world. So thank you very much. And uh... thank you.